Yes, good day, board members and staff, students and guests. Uh, welcome to this brown bag work session. I'd like to introduce Ms. Janice Fernandez, who's going to bring our invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us reflect on how to best serve the students and staff of Southwest ISD. Allow us to work together well, to listen and respect each other's talents and skills, and to be watchful and mindful of the responsibilities we hold as a governing body. May we rejoice in the privilege of watching our students grow into enlightened citizens of the community, and may we, may we maintain focus on the dreams and aspirations of those we serve. In, the name, in your name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one indivisible. Thank you, Ms. Fernandez. Ms. Mayor, thank you. Can I move the one more thing up to the beginning of the session and, and introduce Dr. Faye, uh, who would like to bring uh, early one more thing to the board to our yeah, It'll be a hundred one more things at the end. Go right ahead. So this is Dr. Faye. Of course you guys know that uh, we participate in the state star uh, in the course and the first groups to be tested in uh, all the state of Texas are the SSI grades, which is fifth grade and eighth grade, specifically in reading and math. And so uh, they did that and we have those results back. And so Dr. Faye is going to pick it up from my chair. So I wanted it to be the one more thing because we're really proud of the work uh, this year. Not that we're not proud always, but this year specifically, uh, when you look at fifth grade math, while we saw some a little bit of declines in certain areas, uh, we anticipated some of those declines based on cohorts moving through the system mm -hmm. at certain campuses. But overall, Southwest ISD did not drop in math scores, so we're really proud of that. And I think a big aha is that we have, um, you know, four campuses over 90, one at 99% at Southwest Elementary. And so that's pretty incredible. That's uh, amazing. So we're really excited about that. Wow. And then, of course, uh, the one thing that we've really been concentrating on all year long with your support with the literacy interventionists and the literacy specialists down our elementary schools is our reading scores. And we are super proud to see all green arrows pointing up at every campus. And so yep. when you look at uh, Big Country all the way down to Hidden Cove, um, some schools even went up as much as 18 percentage points, which is a lot of kids. And so Southwest ISD uh, reading and literacy is certainly trending up. Um, and we're on the coattails of the math movement, I think, at this time. And so we're excited about that. If you go to the second page, uh, what you will see is just kind of a district breakdown by campus and we have our middle schools that also took and if you look at eighth grade reading we did see some declines uh, but on that note we did see some gains at McAuliffe Middle School and that's really due to the work that's happening there with the new leadership under Joseph Guidry so we're excited about that work we do have some we're trying to figure out to some degree uh, how does uh, core instruction mesh with intervention once the kids get beyond fifth grade because once they have those huge gaps uh, it is much harder to fill those gaps in a structured day like middle schools are set up with periods of the day. And so the relationship piece is not as, uh, it, it doesn't rain through as much when we're looking at student scores and things like that. But we're excited to know that we are starting to figure it out. Uh, so we should be seeing some gains in that area as well. And then when you look down at fifth grade, I mean uh, eighth grade math, um, I look up, I'm sorry, um, you see these big decreases, okay? And what you should know is that we have 1,035 students in eighth grade this year. 35 students took the eighth grade math. Out of those, seven students passed. So the percentage rate that's going to get reported to their paper is 23% passed. But that's really kind of a mis, uh, misinterpretation of real information because 1,000 students tested in algebra this year. I will test on May 8th. 
So while Southwest ISD is challenging rigor in our middle schools, not every district is going to do that. So you're going to see a big differential when you look at the newspaper coming up. Right. But we decided also not to double test our kids this year uh, because we didn't feel like, you know, we didn't feel it was necessary because we test our kids enough. And so, um, Joanne, yes. the kids that didn't take algebra one was because they are students who were not students at Southwest ISD last year. Um, most of them, I say that. Uh, probably 97% of them were not Southwest ISD students. Um, they came after, um, like, snapshot date, if you will. And so they were students who are currently sitting in their other district in an eighth grade math course, and we, by law, have to offer them the same course. So we did set up in our master schedules the opportunity to have those classes so that we knew we would get those those students in our system because we have a high mobility rate. So out of Southwest ISD kids, however, 97% of them took algebra. Awesome. And so we're excited about that. Yes. So Joanne, are we gonna be able, so once we get the o EOC scores back mm -hmm. for the algebra one, will we be able to extrapolate that information in order to have a better picture of oh. the actual percentage of kids? Absolutely, and, and the algebra score will be the only, actually the combined of the two will be in our accountability subset. Right. And so last year, if you remember at, at Scobie Middle School, 100% of the eighth graders took algebra and they scored at like 94%. Correct. And those were kids who even took the seventh grade assessment and had failed. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're expecting great results. It may not be above 95% this year in algebra, but I would bet uh, anywhere from 80 to 85, and don't quote me on that, but we're excited about the work because what we're doing at Southwest ISD is pushing rigor mm -hmm. into arenas where our kids are, are being challenged now as opposed to waiting and intervening when they can't get it later on. And so. once we have that figure, that extrapolated figure, can we use that figure as a district? Or yeah. yes. yes. We yes. can plug that number in for the public. Correct. Yes. It'll, be, it'll merge with the 8th yes. grade scores that okay. just reported in finality. Okay. It's just when they the express their tries to take parts of what's being reported. Um, we sent uh, basically a narrative that explained to them that out of our 1,035 students, 1,000 of them are in algebra one yes. in the eighth grade. That's Huge. the celebration itself. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, okay. we're trying to make that known, but yeah, they do get merged later on. Okay. And I, I'm just really, I'm excited to share. So when we have exciting things happen, I would love to share them with you. But I will tell you, a lot of the work, um, especially with elementary, uh, belongs to Delila because she's really driven uh, kind of three parallel tracks happening at our elementaries right now and is very uh, adamant that high expectations is what we're going to be about. And obviously, when you set the bar high, our kids can achieve high. And so thank you, Delila, for the work that you've done. And all of CNI, if you're sitting in here, and all of principals and everything. So great job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Marshal. The next thing on the agenda is the memorial project. Yes, I would uh, like to ask if we can wait. We have some students here. If we can uh, let our students go first. We have a lot of things with technology. So it would actually be item B. So we have uh, done a. Uh, We've had a lot of emphasis and in, in invested in technology and the one-to-one -one device and making sure our students have those 21st century opportunities during the learning experience. And we have a staff, I think, at, at Central who really does a great job of shepherding uh, some expectations and, and planting seeds in every one of our campuses and working with teachers and students. And so uh, we have Ms. Dodie Maddox who kind of leads that entity uh, with her staff here. But more importantly, I think she has brought in some students who are going to do parts of the presentation and using technology today. So here's Ms. Cody Maddox. Good afternoon. Um, good noon. <laughs> um, good morning. <laughs> we, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk much. We're going to jump straight to the students. But what we did was we went out to some of um, our teachers and our students and said, please come share um, how technology is affecting your learning experience at Southwest ISD. So with that, I'm going to start with uh, Ms. Donnell Obregon. She's a biology teacher at Southwest High School, and she'll introduce her students. Hi, Donnell Obregon. I teach a uh, biology star um, tested subject at Southwest High School, and I have one of the one um, classes that's a one-to-one -one implementation. Um, so all my students have access to Chromebooks, and uh, we're about 90% able to utilize all the, the G Suite technology that we have available. So I have, um, I'll start with Zachary, right over here. 
and I have Isaiah, Connie, and Tina that agreed to come with me today and talk to y'all a little bit about implementation and how they like um, what we're doing in our in our class so far with using technology. Hello, my name is Zachary Bonda. Um, both customers are healthy because I have um, a disability called cerebral palsy. And in the disability, I can't really write or I can't really um, write papers. So, Roll Classroom has really helped me even when, even in classes that I have to write so much in, and it's a really good thing. We've been able to do a lot of modifications because he's able to tie it really well, just the writing was an issue. So he's able to turn in and email me when he has questions and, and type a lot that way. Um, hi, I'm Steven Duran. I personally love Google Classroom because in, in, as an ROTC, we always go everywhere around the state. We just came back from Florida, and so we missed a couple of days, but I decided to take a Chromebook with me so I could go ahead and use Google Classroom and mm -hmm. that's what I usually use Google Classroom for. And so now I'm always up to date with my classes and I don't have to do like attendance recovery or anything like that. So. Very good. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Connie Grinnell and Google Classroom has helped me because a lot of my a lot of my classes like require like using like the internet and stuff and with Google Classroom it's easier to like Instead of having to like go from the computer to the the paper, you can just like switch the tabs, and it's like I guess it's just easier and more organized for me. And so yeah. And not losing your work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my name is, is Leah Donna, and uh, <coughs> I personally think that Google Classroom is good for Southwest because I'm varsity baseball right now, and uh, I varsity goes everywhere. They travel a lot, and I can get my phone and go on Google Classroom and <clears throat> uh, and get my, my get my work done real quick on there, so I won't worry about missing assignments in there. Going to Cal Allen pretty soon, right? Huh? Going to Cal Allen pretty soon? Yes. Sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> He was like emailing me one night. They were on their way to Laredo, and he was like, "Miss, I'm working on this. Come the bus." So I was like, "Awesome, amazing, great." Did y'all have any questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I just want to make sure I, I understand. We talk, does every student have a Chromebook? Is that the correct statement? Mm -hmm. And that's what y'all are talking about. For use in my class, yeah. They're not actually personally assigned and checked out to them. Um, this is like a classroom set one to one in the class. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they can have to on their own. Uh -huh. On their own devices. And then um, we try to keep some extra devices in the library that, they, that students that don't have a device can check out uh -huh. if they need to. So we've tried two models in the beginning. We've been at this for five years, four or five years. Originally, the plan was to check them out to students and, and listening to our parents' feedback and, and what's happening with devices. They'd rather the students have access to them uh, in the classrooms, and then if a student wants to check one out, just like a library book for two or three weeks at a time, they go by the library and check one out. Uh, and we found out that that seems to be working, I, I think, through elementary through high school. Um, and so it's this is the best model that works for us, and I think uh, uh, the fact that students are using them, they're on Google Classroom, we're learning Google Classroom, we're trying to catch up with their kids. Um, so it's, uh, well, this, really great job that. this kind of question, I, that's one of the questions I have, and just very quickly, the teacher, now, to the teacher, uh, kids want to be on the phone or the device all the time. That's a pretty fair statement, isn't it? If you let them, they would be on there all the time. But now we're giving it to them and letting them use it. I'm wondering how, as a teacher, that affects you. Are you is just an adjustment that you have to, to go through? Yeah, um, I definitely think that the classroom culture is established like the first week of school about the expectations of what we're supposed to be on, what we're not supposed to be on. And of course, I busted some kids on cool math when they're not supposed to be. Um, but it's, it's kind of set up just in classroom management. And um, I 
got a wireless keyboard, so I'm not stationary connected to a mouse. Like, I'm always all over in my room. They'll tell you I'll be, like, over here one second and then right behind them the next. So the wireless keyboard allows me to manage when I have devices all out. So part of it's just classroom management as far as that and establishing that uh, kind of like the culture of utilizing the technology in the classroom. Yeah. So I hear a lot of teachers complain. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't let them use their cell phones. Um, like in my class, we don't really use the cell phones. So I know that some teachers that don't have the computers will have them utilize their cell phones. But because I have a classroom set, there should be no reason for them to be on their cell phones. So it helps eliminate well, distracted. Yeah, distracted. When, I mean, in the future, I guess the younger teachers are fine. But the, but the older teachers have to have, uh, have to adjust to this and have to uh, be able to adapt some different teaching strategies. Mm -hmm. They're going to spend their whole life or the rest of their life frustrated. Uh, and, and there's nothing they can do about it. You can't, or unable to take them away. So you have to take an I, I want to address your question just so you know. So that's kind of where we are. So we don't, unfortunately, get to work directly with the students most of the time. We work directly with the teachers the majority of the time. So. We actually last summer started an event, we call it Hyperdrive, it's a week-long PD event for teachers, and it is about uh, purposeful planning of lessons in the 21st century. So we're bringing in the de devices, and we put them in teams. So now they get to collaborate with somebody that, like Ms. Obermann is coming back as one of our team leaders this year. So she's gonna have a team of teachers that she can take them through and show them what's worked for her, what hasn't worked for her as we go in and develop these lessons. Because the other part of keeping them engaged on the device is that the lesson itself has to be engaging. If we simply take something that they don't enjoy doing and make it electronic, it, that doesn't change what they're doing. Um, so that's so we bring that in. Last year we invited about 65 teachers to Hyperdrive. We had 30 accept. This year we've invited 200 and we are currently at? We are currently at uh, 56. That have accepted. Right. So we um, we got very positive feedback from, la from it last year and so we're hoping to basically double the size this year and, and start spreading that out. So. And I don't know, Ms. Albergan, if you can corroborate this one, but usually we find that, that the technology pretty much acts as a magnifying glass. So like with your classroom behavior, if you have a poor classroom management plan and you throw technology in, it's just going to make it that much worse. Yeah. But if you have great classroom management, it just carries over. Mm -hmm. So it's really about being better, a better educator, better teacher in the classroom. So that's really a lot of stuff that what we do is we try to base it on actual uh, pedagogy. I want to commend uh, the students and Ms. Obergon because what you're really seeing at hand is college and career readiness. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not the academic portion of it, but it is certainly the tool set that they're going to need to be successful in the environment beyond our walls at Southwest ISD. Mm -hmm. And so any environment that you go into beyond our walls, um, you should be thankful to Ms. Obergon. And thank you, Ms. Obergon, on behalf of the district to making sure that our kids are going to be college and career ready, specifically with this tool set. So thank you very much. I agree. Mm -hmm. Next, if you look up on the screen, I'm turning the mic oh, on. So hey, just so you know, there's a camera up there that they're watching right. you guys as well. Oh, okay. Hi, guys. Oh, they're not watching us. Um, Alonzo, can you unmute Daisy? It's not letting me unmute her. But, um, okay, so we're going to, this is Hidden Cove Elementary. This is our librarian. And these students are going to share with us about how they're using technology. Hello. 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 Can we Hello. Hello. I'm uh, Daisy Della Cruz. I'm the Hitting Club librarian. And I use Seesaw here in the uh, library with my students, along with some teachers. They do utilize Seesaw, the Seesaw app. Um, the reason I like using Seesaw is because a few things. One, it gives the students choice on how to present their work or their assignment. Um, they also have collaboration. Some of my students compare it to like an Instagram or Facebook, only it's just the students in the classroom. So they get to like each other's work, um, they get to comment on each other's work, things like that. And I have found that it enhances their experience as students because they get to use their voice. Um, their confidence starts to build up as they start utilizing the voice um, and the video options. Um, 
and the Seesaw app can be integrated with Google as well as um, some app smashing where other apps can be uh, combined into the Seesaw app itself. Uh, but one of the, the really great things that I like to, to use is that uh, Seesaw is great for our bilingual students, um, some that may have little trouble either writing or speaking, uh, writing in Spanish or English, as well as speaking or writing in English, um, vice versa, it gives them the option they can record themselves in Spanish, they can write in Spanish, or vice versa. Um, I've also had some students where they'll type in English, and it may not be, you know, the best writing, but then they also speak in Spanish or vice versa, that way the teacher can see what they were really trying to write or what they were really trying to say kind of a thing. So it kind of works for the teacher to kind of do a checks and balances of what they need to either work on with them or how they're progressing. Awesome. Thank you. Did you have any questions for her? We'll move on to the next group. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Jill, uh, go ahead and go with Isabel. Hi. Hi, Isabel. Hi. This Hello. is Indian Creek. Hi, I'm Isabel Sanchez, fifth grade teacher at Indian Creek. Um, and we have Hamid. He's going to be talking about um, using Google Classroom with enrichment minds. And Kayla, she'll be talking about using Google Classroom in our class. Very good. Thank you, sir. Um, hi, my name is Hamid Jordan, and I'm in the class. Hi, my name is Hamid Jordan, and I'm in the class. And I like Google Classroom and enrichment minds because I get to work at my own pace. I don't need anyone. I don't have anyone telling me that to slow down or anything. I can do it as quick or as slow as I want. And in which you might have a big group of students in it. So I can ask for help and I know at least one student will answer my question. So Hamid works with Enrichment Minds in reading and math uh, through the district. So um, somebody from the district gives him assignments. So he's able to work with a lot of different people, a lot of different students from different elementaries. Kayla uses a Google Classroom in our classroom, um, and so she works mainly with just with the other students in her class. Hi, my name is Kayla Ramirez. I am in Sanchez class, fifth grade. And I like using Google Classroom because we get to learn the things that we learn in class. And I can I get to do my stuff by myself. And I don't like working on groups. And I don't have to wait for other people to be ready. I can just do it by myself and I can take my time. And I like playing with the games that my teacher gives me. So with Google Classroom and my classroom, um, I have assignments for them. And so when I have like a small group, they have an assignment on Google Classroom that gives them links that they can follow, gives them assignments that they need to do and turn in. So I'm able to work in a small group and they are able to work and, um, on topics that we've already done in class. Blended, Blended learning. <laughs> Thank you. I don't. I don't. <laughs> All right, and we're going to go ahead and turn this off. Thank you for your time. We appreciate y'all's feedback. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, so in, in addition to that, I have a, a couple of things. So this year, my team applied for a grant through the foundation, and we were able to get a set of virtual reality goggles which then allows us to use... I get it. Go ahead. <laughs> that, um, so kids can go on a field trip without ever leaving their seats. And so this was the very first field trip we took, virtual field trip we took at Southwest ISD. These are L um, kindergartners at South, um, sorry, Elm Creek with Miss Sola Hub. Okay, so where is it? Where's our field trip? Where are we going to go see? But we live in the United States of America.
Uh, and are we actually going to get to go to a place in Texas? Yes. Yes, we're going to get to go downtown to the Alamo. And we're going to go to California, Arizona, Missouri, Washington, D.C., New York. Yes, remember we love Are y'all ready? participated in something like this and got him very excited about it. So um, we've actually done field trip for the other one at Southwest Elementary, I'm sorry, at Elm Creek. And right now the kid is at the library at Southwest Elementary. So if you want to go participate in one, um, you can go sign in as a visitor over at South, Southwest Elementary. Missy Lotta would be happy to go and see what they're doing with the kids. So they are using that. Um, and we wanted to share that because that's something we've been trying for two years to get now. So we got the kit and we're very excited. And I know Ms. Obergon can't like wait to get it at the high school. <laughs> on the list. <laughs> because there's a cell that they get to go into the cell and like navigate mm -hmm. through the different parts of the yeah, cell. Yeah, they get to go through all the organelles and collect wow. ATP energy and yeah, super cool. So um, I know we're kind of running short on time, so I won't go ahead and play this last video. But the last group we're going to share with you is Mr. Um, Hamilton at McNair. Um, he has uh, his tech apps kits. Um, because they use things like Google Classroom, they move through their tech apps curriculum quickly, and so they get to move into a computer <coughs> science piece, which is coding. So we have kids at McNair Middle School coding video games, writing video games, learning how to develop their own video games through our tech apps classes there. And so we had a little bit of video of them um, learning that coding. So coding is one of the big movements. I'm not sure if you've seen it from President Obama had talked about that every child needs to learn to code. It's not about the tech skills, it's about the thinking skills that come with it. It's very logical thinking, it's problem solving, and it, it applies across all of the other things we're trying to learn. You, you know what, uh, along the lines of coding, uh, last summer my nephew had the opportunity to attend a camp at uh, Trinity, only because his grandparents uh, paid the thousand dollars it cost to go, uh, or else he wouldn't have been able to go. Right. So, um, It'd be nice during the summer if we could get, and he was in the third grade last year. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need to look into that, uh, mm -hmm. an affordable coding camp. So, yeah, because that was an overnight camp. He didn't stay there overnight. Right. But uh, <laughs> it's something that we could easily do in our elementary schools, and maybe uh, the kids that, the people that taught it there 
were college kids that were going to Trinity. Mm -hmm. And they they were young, excited kids, and they engaged. It was all about Minecraft. Mm -hmm. yes. It was a Minecraft. Yes. And, and Mr. Uh, Hamilton so uses Minecraft with his kids and also. It, it, it's so expensive, so really it's hard to get your child there. Yes. But we could provide something like that. And, and we will. I spoke with Dalila and I believe Dodi just a, it was a few months ago about some of the opportunities that we have with current staffing models in our elementary schools. And we have a Pitsco lab. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a STEM classroom in every one of our elementaries. And uh, we're really wanting to become really efficient with that use and, and see uh, that kind of bleed over into outcomes for other programs. Mm -hmm. And so I have asked Delila and I believe Dodi, I can't remember yes. which ones was on the text message, but that I would love and to see coding yes. as pretty much a fundamental uh, um, project or curriculum at Southwest ISD in every single one of our elementary because it will pay dividends later for content uh, if we can begin them very early and not wait until they get to that area. So yeah. I think one of the biggest selling points for the kids was that it was like eight hours mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. And so the summer camp idea or even after school for you know three or four hours every week or whatever. Anyway, it's worth looking into because it's a shame that everybody can't participate in that camp, but it's outrageous. It's and, and for two weeks. And our, our very, like, we, that's where we want to build to, but I can tell you my team, and we've just kind of, discuss this and work with Miss Battles on it, but we're, the Enriching Minds model that we're using for math and reading uh, that Hamid spoke about, it's going really well. So we were looking at all, possibly also bringing in some coding into that same Enriching Minds uh, format, and that way it becomes self-paced in the kids. Like they said, they can do it when they want, they can take their time, they can get ahead, and they have that uh, flexibility as well. Um, and that way, because what, what Dr. Faye was saying earlier, when we run into middle school and we, we run into very rigorous scheduling, it makes it a little bit harder to get everything in. So if we start um, engaging them at elementary and then providing the opportunity for them to grow throughout, um, we're, we can get them involved that way because it becomes something they're passionate about. Thank so. you. So the idea is to share uh, just kind of a, a, a drop of what's happening in technology or so many other aspects of technology. I know we've done cyber camps in the summer uh, before, and we will continue doing those, uh, those uh, opportunities. We're involved in a grant with uh, Congressman Hurd uh, to train teachers in coding uh, in uh, order to build the, the instructor to build the kids. So I just want to give you kind of a, a opportunity to see some of the students' testimonials and some of the things that are happening in technology. It, it, from where we were four or five years ago, it's tremendous in seeing the progress. And uh, it's not only important to train our youth, but train our, our mature uh, adults. Uh, since we are migrating to these systems that our students are growing up with, they do have uh, basically a definitely uh, hit start on, on that. So that concludes that item of information number one, sir. I want to commend Dodie and her team. I'm, I'm sorry, but they—they yeah. they, um, this year has been just an incredible year in curriculum instruction. Where one of the the issues is trying to break down all the barriers within our own departments within the division, and there is not a team uh, in that in our division now that doesn't want to get into each other's business. And so <laughs> they have really this team in particular has really engaged with moving. Uh, core academic instruction in our district in a way that would be impossible without them. So thank you, Dodie and Danny. And tell Dale I said good things about him, too. Uh, and and Alonzo. So thank you very much. I, I think they left the camera on. I probably heard you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. There they are all. Awesome. Yeah. 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 All right, you want to go on with the memorial project? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, <laughs> item A is... Uh, we want to give a high-level presentation, some ideas. We have uh, Rafael uh, Brajas and Carson Garcia, uh, who knows our district really well. Uh, this is kind of an idea uh, that's kind of uh, immersed in the, you know, the adage, if you want to know where you're going, you have to, to really kind of know where you've been and, and celebrate uh, your history and, and celebrate those folks uh, who uh, may have been contributors to our system and because of some some issue or, or uh, thing that happened, they no longer are. So we really want to celebrate uh, categories of students uh, in a memorial park project. 
And uh, as you guys know, we had a really significant historical piece of property uh, gifted to Southwest ISD that we think that, that timing uh, of that opportunity, <coughs> based on uh, how we want to create a memorial and remembrance of folks, we'd like to uh, put together a program that re reflects and memorializes those students uh, who uh, may not be with us any longer uh, on this earth, but whose presence was significant. Uh, we want to remember those folks in, in our system who may have been employees or educators uh, who met an untimely departure from this world uh, and to the next. Uh, and we'd like to remember uh, those folks who may have graduated from Southwest ISD, uh, who uh, serviced the country, um, and uh, who may be first responders, service to community, um, have uh, experienced a loss of life, but we want to keep their memory and legacy alive. And, and so we came up with this idea of creating a memorial kind of uh, area, park, and of course this would be a complete fund balance item. It's not in any of our projects. We're, we're Ed, I think, I've seen him out there late on a Friday walking the property. Uh, I think we would like to present where we are right now uh, and then kind of uh, hear from our board if this is something you'd like us to keep going down. Um, we think it's going to be one of those issues in our district that are, are going to be complementary of community, <coughs> complementary of, of our past, and complementary uh, of the legacy of the, the students, the educators, the employees, uh, in service to country and service to community that we all celebrate. Uh, but. For some reason, those folks aren't with us. We want to keep the legacy alive, and so I'll let Rafael kind of start this. We look at some things, and yes. we're going to present, and we'd like to answer any questions we have today. So, fortunately for us, uh, Dr. Burst have already hit our first two slides. So my part is over. <laughs> uh, um, I have here uh, Mr. Ed Garcia, um, who's assisting us with this project as well. Um, and I'll, I'll let it off to, to Ed to go over what we're thinking our conceptual idea uh, would be for this memorial park. Thank you, Dr. Uh, well, thank you for allowing me to come back. It feels like a reunion. <laughs> and uh, I'm not used to wearing ties anymore. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I had, my, my wife had to find me one, but, uh, more. but uh, it sure is great seeing everybody. I just want to, I, I was really blown away by the presentation before and the Google learning. Uh, that's, that's amazing to hear. Uh, I remember 2005, was my first, first year I'd been here, uh, right here in 04. But I remember going to Creewald and we had a work order, we had to look at one of the classrooms and I remember walking into the traditional classroom, and every student put their eyes on me. They wanted to know who I was and what I was doing there. And that work order kind of related back to the, another classroom next door. We went to the classroom next door. Well, that was a, a, a technology. The, the kids were in their computers. And not a single student raised their head to look at me or my <laughs> And that was the first time I realized that technology was really having an impact with students. And, and then to hear this today, it almost makes you want to go back to school because I mean, it seems like it's exciting to learn again. So that's great. I'm glad we're doing that. Uh, going back to this project, uh, this is unique. Uh, you don't have too many uh, school districts uh, honor, like Dr. Burstow said, students, staff, a faculty that, that made a, an impact. And they're in the school district, and so trying to memorial, you know, put them a, mem a memory uh, to those folks in, in form of a memorial is, is pretty nice. Um, I've been working on parks lately, so this kind of fits into some of the things that I've been doing. But um, when I was told of the location, uh, we were looking at the at the property that was donated um, by uh, was it Miss. Collins, yes, Miss Collins. It was three acres, a little over three acre site, and that's shown right here with this property. That's the three acre site. So it's right off of Old Pearsall Road, Southwest Elementary, and of course the Medina River runs right there. And um, where is the cemetery? Cemetery is right next door. Right here. 
there's the house. And the house is here. And then there's a barn right there. It's that mm -hmm. whole uh, kind of whitish colored yeah. section. Right. right. And so the, the property is fascinating. It's hard to, to really uh, appreciate what the property does, but it, there, it's not really that usable when you get down to about right here. It really slopes down you know, pretty, pretty fast. We don't have any topography to, to understand exactly how the contours are working, but we were able to go to the U.S. Geological's uh, site, and we were able to get some general contours as to what it, what's going on. And so there's one, the next slide shows that, um, that the property is kind of level up here, but then it begins to slowly drop, and then it has a dramatic drop straight down. But if you're able to walk the site, there's some very nice views of the, of the Medina River. And so, you know, in, in a memorial, it just seems like you want a space to reflect. And uh, it just seems like that's a, a, a natural location to do that. Um, and so, because of the steep site, if we wanted to have kind of a meandering trail, we'd almost have to work with the contours. And so it, it'd almost have to be like a switchback type of walkway that's working with the contours instead of going against it. So it, it would be a meandering trail in the trail itself. There'd be benches, some landmarks, some, some items that we could identify to provide a memorial. Um, and then as you approach kind of the viewing area down there, maybe that's more the focus of the memorial itself. Uh, Parking is being suggested up here, right where the level area is, and uh, this is where the barn is, and then the trail would just pick up from here and then meander all the way down to that viewing area down below. The, the concept's a little exaggerated uh, because this may not, may not go as far out. It may come back in, but it's just to show the concept of how this, <coughs> this project may evolve. <coughs> Don't have a budget. Uh, I know Brandon was asking me this morning if we had a budget. We haven't had an opportunity to put any numbers to it. But, uh, you know, we would need to provide a uh, parking lot, uh, lighting, uh, security is, is another issue. How do, we, how do we keep everybody safe down there um, you know, if you're meandering down to, to uh, an area where there is, you know, is isolation? So we have to think about security and the safety of, of anybody that would use that, that site. But this is where we're at right now. It's just a, a concept that's just been developed. Yes, Dr. Well, I do thank you for, for doing this. Uh, Dr. Versa, for telling me that you were engaged, and I was so glad to hear that, <clears throat> because you have a long enough historical uh, record with the district to know yes. how important this, you know, something like this is. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, cemetery has great historical yes. significance as well as the house. And the, you know, this was really one of the first settlements uh, that took place uh, even before Texas became a republic. <coughs> so it's very significant, as well as some of the characters that were around there uh, at the time were very historically important, mm -hmm. such as Sam McCullough. Uh, Midfield Wallace lived right down the road, uh, just right down the river were two uh, signers of the Texas Declaration of Independence. It's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. Now, why do we do this? Because we want other people to know. Because today, most people don't have any idea. Uh, <clears throat> I work with the Somerset Historical Society. They don't know anything about Man's Crossing. Mm -hmm. So I was just going to suggest as you think about this, a couple of things. One, uh, three things. One is, how do you tell the history besides just having a, some mm -hmm. people's names. How do we get a feel for how, how important this area was? Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is to include people such as Sam McCullough and others uh, that historically were very significant. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, and I don't know how we can do it here, but what, we're, what we want our kids to know is that there are very important people have graduate, graduated Southwest besides Dr. Burst. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and Dr. Fay, who 
is very notable in our own right, as well as, <laughs> as, well as others uh, uh, that have gone on and become uh, very notable. And, and how do we do that? I know we talked about doing that at the school. I don't know whether you would do this or here or not. Uh, but I think it's really important that a young kid going to Southwest knows, wow, he went to Southwest. Right. You know? So I just wanted, wanted to share those thoughts. And, and to partially answer that, um, this is, I think, part of the program. I know we've talked about incorporating the house uh, as part of that other program to create and bring up to the forefront a museum and port of history on, on uh, piggybacking with technology that would also be uh, a thing that we would want to probably include it within the house. Maybe some technology, PowerPoint presentations that you know, slide through uh, the history of the community. I know we've talked about it in several meetings, but it's kind of a combination and kind of a destination of significant and historic significance of the district. Not only to uh, to honor those that have fallen, but also remember those that were really important figures before Southwest even, uh, Southwest ISD uh, existed formally as a school district. So it's, it's still in the process of meshing all these ideas and all these programs, but I think this location would uh, lend itself to, to really service all So those. are we looking to start off with the park piece or with the museum piece? With the memorial piece or the museum piece? Well, right now we're just in the you conceptual idea, mm -hmm. right. So um, it would it depend on, on what we hear from y'all as a school <laughs> and see what we want to move forward. Well, I know y'all said that this would uh, be a fun balance item and I'm wondering um, many, many times when people want to do memorials, or museums, they ask the public for donations, and maybe we could start by doing a GoFundMe and asking our community to, mm -hmm. you know, ten dollars a piece. There's a lot of us. Yes. We may maybe could get started as we, you know, possibly push forward mm -hmm. and conceptualize the entire project. Yes. Uh, and I, I'll speak to that. It is a uh, fun balance item in the arena. Uh, 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 conservation in the arena of historical, we understand that there are really some great grant opportunities that we would apply for and, and try to ascertain and then fill in the remainder with the fund balance uh, part. Uh, we know that in our conversations with the San Antonio Conservation Society at that time, the lady was, was uh, a historical architect uh, and she knew of a, a number of grants. Our goal was to take the home back to its original state of the log, mm -hmm. one log per group, basically. Right now, in the 70s or 80s, there was a piece added on, so of course we would work with them and try to, to bring it back. Because original wood on the outside is original wood on the outside. Um, we're going, the first thing we try to do to finance this is go out to grants. And I think they would complement. I think the historical significance and, and the legacy significance kind of complement each other. And so we would, try to bring to, to the board that uh, we get beyond the conceptual idea of, you know, do we want to continue going down this road because I think it's quality work. I think we are the closest thing to a municipality that our communities will ever have. And so if we don't do this, who will? And so it's like, if not us, you know, who will? You know? So I think uh, what we're looking for is, do you want us to continue down this vein of work? Uh, then we'll get with Francis, who in our mind is really a grant expert, and her and Brandon work very good together. Get them with the San Antonio Conservation folks. Um, we also had a meeting with a gentleman uh, by the name of Miller and Associates, who says he has access to <coughs> grants in, in that arena. And so we would definitely try to get the majority of it funded through those grants. But do you have a fundamental? Um, do you not want? I know in certain situations you sometimes don't like the idea of necessarily going to the public and asking for donations. Is that the case for this one? Um, just to be honest, I don't think we've had that conversation, but I think we should be willing to have it. Okay. Uh, I know that we've tried some things in the past with the pavers and things like that, that um, you know, there's, there's a great idea uh, behind it, but maybe we just didn't, maybe we didn't implement it correctly, or maybe there's a better way to kind of bring that back too, because I think I think once we develop this opportunity, I think that's going to really help everyone really appreciate the, you know, we, we say, remember our past, celebrate our future, and boldly look forward to the future, and, and this is one big tenet of that, remembering our past. 
I think uh, if we get this right, I think it will complement the other thing we're trying to do in our favorite projects and things like that as well. So, uh, I think it's a conversation we need to have. We haven't had okay. it. But that was a great question, Dr. Brown, because uh, on the historical side, Raphael's already done a lot of research. Uh, I was amazed how much he, information he's already gathered on individuals. And so, uh, I don't know, it's probably 10 pages long right. that you've got. I thought so first off, maybe we can give them the award they're going to win Saturday. <laughs> Someone, <laughs> Sunday. Sunday, I'm sorry. I think that would be a great start. So. Uh, they already did get can Sunday. I get that in writing? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I guarantee this bill. So. Didn't we get some money already? Uh, the other day, they they gave when we were five thousand. Oh yes, five thousand. That could be seen. Absolutely, you could. If that's if that is the desire, I think we're going to wait till Sunday to see if we add the twenty-five to that. Maybe it's another thirty. That would be enough to take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's really a great way to use those funds. Those funds are to do something different yeah. and yeah. Uh, innovative and, and beyond yeah. normal. And I think that'd be a really great project to look for. Just to, to look at these uh, presidents, these are just kind of ideas that are out there um, already. Uh, as memorials. Uh, the top two are actually here. The top left is a brand new memorial that was done at UTSA and actually unveiled, I think it was last month. Uh, the one on the right hand side, that is a park downtown by uh, Ms. Linda Pace, I believe. She did that memorial park uh, as an honor to her child. So this is kind of what we were talking about, meandering paths and benches. Uh, those benches actually have quotes um, on them, mm -hmm. written down of storybooks that she um, she read to her child as, as he was uh, a kid. And there are some other ones that are more into the, the church uh, memorial services, something more sculptural. So we're just playing with ideas of, of what it is. So um, as of right now, we're just, again, trying to gather information and research on, on method. Security will be a big one, like we said. Uh, just something that, that can actually also be easily expandable. Uh, unfortunately, names are going to come up and be added. It's just uh, a cycle, but that's something to think about as we move forward. So. Great job, Raphael. Thank you. Thank you all. Other things we want to do is the technology. We want it to be like a living memorial. And so every name placard would have a cube. Code, uh, and then that Q code would go where we would work with the families that they can actually upload uh, pictures, they can upload videos, uh, and so it becomes kind of living. And so if you want to go see who that person is, it would be up to the family right. to kind of... Yeah. We would love what we have in the district as part of yearbooks and things like and that. And then somebody would monitor it before it Yes. Yes, they would definitely have an oversight uh, aspect. So good point. And it's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, these guys are, are, are very creative thinkers, and uh, if we get the green light to keep moving forward, I'm sure we're going to see some really great um, things come out of it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next thing is uh, professional development plan. Put that over to Dr. Frey. Yes. Dodie, can you pull that up for me? So, oh, yeah, the PD, sorry. So. So while Dodie's pulling that up, uh, I want to, there's a, a few people in here who, that need to be recognized for the project that we're about to present. Uh, Dodie and her team, first and foremost. Um, Delila, Danny, Francis. Am I missing it? Jason, Brandon, Sarah, all my peeps. Uh, and so this year, about three months ago, I presented an idea to senior staff about trying to cross division the professional development and the system that would meet the needs of all of our professionals. And so we have, um, we have a PD uh, plan for the first time at Southwest ISD that's just about ready to go live. We wanted our board to see it first. Uh, so that new teachers to the system, directors, EDs, onboarding of principals, onboarding of new teachers, teachers that have been here for 20 years, that all of the clerks, uh, all of those uh, professionals and, and employees in our system would have a way to grow in their own professional development at Southwest ISD. 
And so we created some subcommittees with facilitators. One of those subcommittees was administrative leadership, which is different than instructional leadership. Um, so we have an administrative leadership strand. We have a leadership, instructional leadership strand. Uh, we have a teacher leadership strand. And then we have a paraprofessional strand, paraprofessional staff strand. So Francis and Patty have led both the, and Jason, the admin and paraprofessional, kind of with the oversight of Sarah and Brandon. And then my team, Dalila and Jennifer, have uh, led more of the instructional leadership pieces. And so what we're trying to do is everybody has a stripe on that success ball in the district. It's not just instruction, it's <coughs> instruction. And so some of our gaps actually exist in other areas. And if we don't pay attention to those areas, then we will never move the system forward fast like I think we can. And so uh, we've been meeting uh, bi-weekly for about two and a half months now. And uh, I'm glad to say that we have a PD plan for the first time before August, um, and we're getting ready to unleash that. And so Dodie and her team have been critical uh, in that they've dedicated an entire website to this. And so uh, with uh, their genius, uh, we have four different academies. Basically, we have an iLead pathway, an iLead institute, a lead conference, a lead academy, and a lead up. And let's go to the lead up one. This pr pretty much pertains to every employee in the district. And so whenever we come back, those of us who get to have a summer, when you come back to the district, all employees have required trainings that they have to do. And things like sexual harassment, bloodborne pathogens, every employee in the district has to do that. And so um, we have this, is it, are you gonna pop up the other two? I'm trying, they're uh, okay. popping up. We're popping. having technology difficulties. <laughs> you can't live without it and you can't live with it sometimes. And so anyway, you don't have to go through every module, but I wanted to show y'all kind of the work that's happening. Um, that really is a work of all the divisions now. It's not just the work of one team. And so, um, uh-oh, she's, she's Googling it now. self-paced and they're doing it on their own? There is going to be some blended. There's going to be some that's self-paced. They can choose it face-to-face -face or in an uh, online environment. So we're excited about that. And so as she's uh, moving that, I really want to, I'll key on, is it letting you in? Yes. Okay. If we could go to... So safety, so like this is one that they'll be able to go to this website and every district employee can go here to look at the things. So allergy ready, bloodborne pathogens, McKinney Vento, sexual abuse. Those are all required trainings that typically we push out like when everybody comes back to work. Some of them can be done on their own time, right? All of them, all of these, right? There's going to be some that we have to wait on Region 20 to get and things like that. But for the most part, this is a great example of the work that used to be completed in August that's already completed in April or May 1. And so we're excited about that. Can we go to the t new teacher institute? So they're that's going to be able to do that at home? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we will unleash everything that we can roll out immediately. We will. Um, and there will be some, some that we just can't because we're dependent on Region 20 for those trainings. But... Everything that we can, we will unveil. Did y'all design that, or did some, or did they give it to you? We uh, no, most of it's it's provided from okay. whatever uh, we server, just put it right? On our own. Mm -hmm. Yes, and okay. so this is um, typically we have this new teacher training, and y'all come to a big luncheon, and so we're still going to have that. Um, but one of the things that's going to be different is we're developing new teacher pathways. And so if you're a new teacher to the system, there's going to be certain things that we're trying to onboard you with, kind of the we are Southwest way, mm -hmm. um, which will be very inclusive to specifically what their job is going to be. So we're trying to get away from the one size fits all model of PD because we know that that doesn't work in the classroom and it certainly shouldn't work in the employee environment as well. But if you go back up to like a pre, okay, the grade four PD pathway, these are going to be all the trainings that a grade four new teacher would need at Southwest ISD, and it's already lined up and ready to go. Some of that will be blended learning, some of that will be face-to-face. -face. So that's an example of a teacher pathway. If we go to the admin pathway, uh, real quick, and I just wanted to show y'all because we're, we're just about done, uh, but if I go to, wanna, hold on, 
go back real quick. So one of the things that we know is, is really critical to our success, and obviously we're doing a lot of work with Holdsworth, is the role of the leader on the campus. And for the first time, we're going to start addressing the role of the assistant principal on the campus, because that's been kind of a missing link for us. And we, we hire them, they have a certain skill set, and we don't really provide a lot of wraparound support to their success. And then we, we, we end up uh, playing catch up by putting out a bunch of fires all year long. And so what you see here is you have an elementary principal strand, an elementary AP strand, secondary principal, secondary, and then all admin, right? So what we're trying to do is tailor very specifically the professional development about what is it that a principal really needs to know and be, and be good at. And then how do we wrap around that support with their AP so that their AP can help that success of the principal happen? And so this is our Eiley Elementary principal. And one of the things that we're doing um, is we're required, all of the people that are delivering the PD this year, will, most of us will be internal. Uh, so we're trying to tap into really successful, um, uh, credible people that are so that we're not having to hire out uh, because we believe that we have expertise in the system. But we're also allowing some flexibility on when this happens. So for example, normally in our admin retreat day, the last day of that retreat for all admin in the system is this day of they get to hear from HR, business and finance, field trips. I mean, it's like, it's like overwhelming. And I remember sitting in that chair as a principal where I'm like, ugh, you know, and then you go back to your campus and you open a building and you forget everything that you just got through hearing. So they will have three opportunities to take the required admin PD. Um, they will have two opportunities in June and then they'll have an opportunity in August. One of the main uh, catalysts to moving in this direction where we're developing PD early is because we want principals and APs to be on their campus the month of August without having to go to a whole bunch of meetings because the priority should be opening their building day one so that kids can start day one and be successful in that environment. So principals have basically about, or admin have about 60 hours of required training now at the district level that will happen. Um, but they get to do it within the flexibility of their summer. Yes. So the only thing that we're requiring is that in the month of June, that we don't have to uh, battle with everybody taking vacation at different times of the year, because we really couldn't get anything done, right? It's because you have three people taking vacation, and so now we're providing some flexibility and options, though three options, two in June, one in August, and then we're also having our admin retreat, which was pretty much locked down. So. It's a little bit different. Uh, it'll be the first time that we've done anything like this to, to this level. Uh, very proud of the work that Dodie and the facilitators have done because the other part of this is putting it all on a calendar and making sure that there's no overlap and principals can get to where they need to go without missing something. And so that is currently mostly all worked out. Um, the month of July is pretty open for them so they can go on vacation, enjoy their families, hit the refresh button. And then when they come back in August, most of it from should be already done, but there's flexibility in the schedule if not. The other thing that we're doing, if we'll scroll up, is there's going to be some things that are not required of APs, but they're going to be recommended so that if we have people that are aspiring principals, that they're locking in early to some of the learning, that we're not going to basically saying we're not going to pay you to go to these, but if you want to come, you're welcome, and this is for your own professional growth so that you may someday sit in that principal chair. And the responsibility of investing in yourself for growth is really important as we move the system forward, is that we all have to be willing to put out there that we're willing to grow on our own. And so, um, so that's pretty much it. I just wanted to show you all kind of a snapshot. If, if you go back to the main page again, it is a dedicated web page now. Uh, HR will get all the links uh, so that when we get new teachers to the system, They'll have a, a link that they can go to and they can line up all their new teacher training that they're going to have to do and some of it will be online, some of it will be face to face and things like that. So, so Joanne, do you anticipate, that's something that I hear a lot from teachers is that they need the time, right before school starts, they need the time in their classroom to get ready but they have to go to do all these things. So you're saying we're resolving that for the principals and the APs. Is that kind of resolved for the teachers as well? Are they getting more time? In their classroom? That's that really is the focus. Is that the 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 guardrails that I from the vision point uh, as a leader is I said these are the guardrails. Mm -hmm. The guardrail is make sure that they can open their buildings without being and sitting in meetings for 24/7 mm -hmm. for yes. the month of August, but right? Teachers too. Teachers will be part of that. Now there's going to the other thing if you go to the 
yeah, teacher one that's where you show like the mapped out August, February, that those links. Yeah. Is there will be some district staff development days. These are already built in to the to the website. And so the teacher development strand is actually being facilitated by Doty and Belia. Mm -hmm. And they're they're not quite finished with that, but the focus is around the one size does not fit all. Right. And what a one year teacher needs is not going to be the same thing that a five year teacher needs. And so a five year teacher that has already sat through T tests, we wouldn't want them to have to do that again. Make sense? Yes. So if a new teacher has to sit into it at the beginning of the school year in that time crunch that you're talking about, the answer is yes, they're going to have to because it's a requirement, but the other teacher may not necessarily have to do that. So we will do our best to try to mitigate anybody being unable to start the school day off on day one with kids in the right way. That's kind of the mission. Okay. So um, very proud of that work. Uh, first time ever. I know we've sat in July trying to come up with what we're going to do. Uh, for teachers and so this is refreshing to know that uh, we're not changing gears our focus will be literacy again next year we're seeing great results with that and it can only get better the more momentum we have behind that and as long as we stay focused on that and so thank you to my team and to everybody around that's been helping with the project thank so you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank I think I have the next one too right summer school Summer school, uh, yes. So we presented the summer school plan at the last board meeting, and I'm gonna ask Richard and Eliza to come up uh, because Dr. Verstuff gave us the go ahead to go ahead and include uh, some additional summer programming that we've had in the past. And so I'm gonna let Eliza speak first and then Richard will come in and share what we're gonna do with fine arts. Um, I went ahead and did a budget breakdown on the first page of your meeting and then a detail of each one of the uh, programs on the next two pages. And so basically, um, I know one of your concerns is the coding. We are gonna be opening Say Yes to third, fourth, and fifth grade this year instead of just fifth grade, so that way they could grow and have a program for three years. We're also gonna do the makerspace that we did last year. We were able to open that up for families to come in with their children, three to 10 years old, to do anything. We had redos, we had robotics, we had coding on the computers, we had Legos, and we just had different things that they got to just play with and, and learn through through um, uh, hands-on activities. The last one on there is our UIW camps. We have a great partnership with UIW. So we have um, three different camps that we're gonna offer this year. Mini gyms is for girls, sixth through eighth grade. Mini semis is for boys, sixth through eighth grade. And then our health professions camp, camp for ninth and tenth graders. So those are the three Richard programs that we're we're requesting. How are the funding. students chosen to attend since it's limited? For the for so say yes, the, the one for elementary, we <coughs> do A B honor roll, and the STEM teachers get to choose two per grade level per school. <coughs> so years past it was only fifth grade, and they all got to choose six, and they had a hard time doing. Because we had other programs, SSI, there were other things that were, so our enrollment was like 40, 45, when we could have 66. So last year, we talked to the teachers, and they came, well, why don't we do it third, fourth, and fifth? Mm -hmm. We hit more grade levels. Okay. They're growing every year, because once you go to fifth grade, then you're done. You don't really have something else. And so if we get two from each grade per school, then we'll be able to meet our max. And then um, the STEM teachers really at the middle school as well get to and that's based on the thing they cut the flyers, we send them all out, they turn in the application. We really haven't had to turn anybody away before. So it hasn't been, oh, we got 20 and we can only take 10. We haven't gotten to that point yet. So I think once we come to where we hit our max, then we can talk to UIW about opening more spots, but we're not there yet. How many spots are available for the makerspace? We um, set up for 50, we have it in the library. So okay, which library? We have not decided where the Richard program is going to be held at. Last year was at Elm Creek, so we set up in the Elm Creek Library. And we had the tables set up for all the different activities. And I think we have, the most we had last year was like 25 kids at Isn't that um, school a little bit like far for most of the district? And do we, we did, not want to try to do a more central location? So we're talking about using Southwest Elementary for enrichment this year, or maybe um, McCulloch. Or but somewhere or in like this medio or something. <laughs> and if we, uh, the middle school has the computer space that we need if we do some more of the coding where elementary is limited. So 
but that's the only reason we would go to a middle school, just because usually we have the high school ones here, but we're going to be doing instruction, so we're trying to stay away from yeah, that. I think the elementary kids think they were hot stuff going to the middle school. So um, maybe we'll call it for me. Yeah. And do, do re you, you, they register for the makerspace through, mm -hmm. how do they? We haven't had to do that yet. Okay. We, last year was the first year we did it. We didn't have more than 25 families. Did you show up? Mm -hmm. oh. Because it's for families. It, we're, we're encouraging yes. families yeah, to come in. Yes. So it's not where you just come and drop off your kids. No, no. We want everybody. And we had families, and we had some kids that went every every day, all the days that we offered it. So she, so like one week we had certain activities out, and we put them away, pull out some other ones. How many hours We did it for, I think it was four hours during the day. And we um, promoted the free lunch that they had, so that way they could go do their lunch. Like a 10 to 2 or something? Like it, a 10, 10 to 2, 10 to 3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Great job, Thank you. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much. The next thing is the Southwest logo. Hold on. We have Richard presenting on fine arts okay. for summer I'm programs. Sorry. It's just an additional one. While Richard is putting this together, I'm all about thanking uh, the people that work so hard in the time crunch for us. And so thank you to Richard and Eliza who had to pull together very fast something that normally takes uh, months to prepare. And so thank you very much to Richard and Eliza. Um, so what you have in front of you is a breakdown of the, the, the total amount we're, we're seeking for, for the budget for the Fine Arts Academy. Uh, and that breakdown shows you what's happening by strand, uh, so that you can you can see what our offerings are going to be and what the costs are for each one of those. Um, notable to how this this year's academy would look different from previous years is that we would not be having the the elementary extravaganza portion of the uh, of the academy. And the reason being is that thinking that we weren't going to have the academy, I had already enrolled uh, our elementary teachers in a in a in a uh, in a training mm -hmm. that normally occurs during the academy. So I saw this as an opportunity to get that training for them, uh, since we were going to have the summer open. And so I enrolled all of them in that. Um, and so, however, there will be a chance for elementary students to be a part of the academy. Uh, but involved in a different way. So if you look down where it says elementary choir, our choir uh, directors are wanting to do a grade three through five elementary choir, mm -hmm. and we would house that at uh, Medio Creek. And so that there's an opportunity for elementary students to be involved. And then also at uh, in the theater production in the musical, we would continue what we've been doing, which is including the third through fifth graders as well uh, as part of the as part of the musical. And uh, at this time, we're looking at uh, putting on the uh, 101 Dalmatians uh, kids version uh, of the musical. It's about a 30-minute musical. Um, and the reason we went normally the musicals for about an hour. Uh, we're shortening down to about 30 minutes because of some constraints with the testing and so forth. We're pretty much limiting our our uh, academy down to two weeks rather than the normal three weeks. <laughs> because of that, uh, you can only cover so much material in, in eight days. Mm -hmm. And so um, we are going with a shorter musical so that because we have shorter rehearsal time in order to do that. Um, and so. Uh, there's kind of the breakdown of everything. We'll be utilizing uh, Legacy, Resnick, and uh, Medio Creek. Are some, I noticed that most of them are my Legacy, like you just said. Is yes. there transportation for those that want to go from other areas? Yes, we're transporting all kids to Legacy for summer school, Resnick for summer school, and Medio Creek yes. from all over the district. So yes. those are our three sites for the summer for all programs that need to be there if we, they want transportation and get fed. Will they be taken summer. from here or from their sites? From wherever they're at their house, we're going to pick them up and take them to Resnick right. if they're going okay, to the Resnick Summer School or program there or Legacy or Middle Creek. We also have a feeding program at Hitting Cove, but we won't have transportation going there. That's just kind of open up the area to have a second feeding site mm -hmm. that's about free lunch and free breakfast. 
And that's normal for, for what we do every year. The, the Fine Arts Academy piggybacks onto the summer school uh, sites and so for transportation and for uh, the, uh, the cafeteria. And uh, in addition to that, what's really nice is that because other districts do it a different way uh, when they do things like this, um, they, the students just go out to their normal spot where they pick up the bus. It's not like you have to, the parents have to drive them to a certain school and then they pick them all up at that one school or something. So uh, it's been pretty great. So any other um, any questions? I think it looks awesome. I'm excited about the elementary choir. Yes, I, we are too. Okay. Yes. And, uh, thanks for doing this at the last minute. It really, yes, it looks nice. It's going to be nice for the community. And how much less is this than what we usually spend? It's about uh, twenty-three, twenty-four thousand dollars yes. less than normal. And most of that is the the fact that we're not doing the extravaganza component. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we we normally have that elementary extravaganza, which is solely a self-contained fine arts elementary uh, program, and that involves several teachers and you know all of that because of their the little ones we involve more personnel. So it takes a big chunk of of money to, to do that. So because we're not offering that, that's why the cost came down. Okay. I would say that this wasn't, both of these 77 and 2300,000 was not budgeted for. I know Mr. Correct. Flores does not have this in his budget. So we're working through Correct. that uh, and looking at funds that we have available uh, with title and other funds, but there may be an ask later to help cover until so we can fix it and remedy this for next year's budget. If, if we can't come up with more funds. You mean from fund down. Correct. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah. Although it wasn't budgeted, we, very, we feel very strong about being able to provide, you know, activities for the kids during the summer. These extracurriculars are something they look forward to, and it's important to us and to them as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, stop with logo. Yes, yeah. I think we do this in about five minutes because yeah. I know we have a closed session, but this goes uh, along with our work with old work and uh, culminating. Uh, activity uh, that we want to present as item information and actually bring it for adoption uh, in a future board meeting. So in our last uh, board meeting, uh, we got to talk to you about the leadership definition, uh, kind of the three big things that Southwest ISD has been working on. And in that process, uh, we've been working on the big visual uh, that's going to come out of that. And so uh, while Holsworth has been holding down the reins and telling us we're, we can't move forward quite yet like we like to at Southwest ISD, uh, we are ready to unveil the visual that goes along with their leadership definition. <coughs> and you will be asked uh, kind of to adopt this at the, the May meeting, the May reg regular board meeting. Uh, but we wanted to share with you uh, and unveil the first um, this is our official uh, We Are Southwest uh, logo uh, that aligns with our leadership definition. And the three big target areas are the commitment to growth, commitment to serve, and commitment to results. And you got to see the, the language in our last board meeting that basically identified that. And so moving forward, as this is kind of the foundation work of our home, and that everything that we will be doing around leadership development will be aligned to this to include uh, eventually how we evaluate leaders in our system and how we um, identify future leaders for the system and how we align all the work at Southwest ISD to ensure success of our students. And so uh, just wanted you guys to see this. Uh, they had a bigger one, I believe, at the Saturday meeting, but they took it back to Dallas. And so print shop as fast as I could this morning because uh, I got it last night, printed these for us. And so how did that work? Um, so. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll answer them. But and where is that going to be? So it will be basically the visual that we use when we're, it'll be unveiled at convocation for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be used on shirts, shirts, <laughs> arm sleeves, however you want it, but it will be. But most of the time when we use it, we will not include this verbiage because it's too much. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the big visual, certainly it will be. Just the commitment to growth. Yes, commitment to growth, commitment, commitment to serve, and commitment to results. Can we put sir. can we can we put those prominent somewhere in yeah, on, it, in each building or yes, like as we, the parents walk in or okay. yes. As a matter of fact, we have finally uh, Janice yesterday got abruptly interrupted 
uh, during our steering group committee. And Janice will actually be sitting on our steering group uh, moving forward so that she can help us with kind of a marketing campaign and planning around how we roll this out and how we keep it at the forefront of our work. Kind of and hard so to see the commitment to serve. It is. Yeah. yeah. So the whole thing behind, behind it, where at the unveiling Saturday at the event, yeah. they had all seven of the participating yeah. ISD oh, logos there. Yes. yes. Ours was really the one that really oh, yeah. uh, reflected our district to the T. Yeah. And you know, I think there are some other ones that that, uh, that is what they believe. Uh, I'll tell you, looking at the ones out there, I'm very proud, and I know it's because we're from Southwest. But when we say we are Southwest, we want it to be the same thing to everyone. And so right now, when we say we are Southwest, it means different things. So you don't want this unveiled until, completely until convocation next year? Oh, trust me, I bet it's already on Facebook right now. Oh, we're using it. Of course not. I, for, I am sorry, I forgot to give you your individual but call. Oh, that's okay. Awesome. Rollout, These are the, very the nice. There's kind of a soft rollout. We're in a soft rollout process right now. Yeah. So, and, and, and it's what, it's basically, it, it's an envelope, but there's a lot of hours right behind oh, it. Oh, yeah. And it was some, it's been something, something else, like four or five different times. Dr. Verso, if I want to say that I really love the way y'all have grown. I mean, it started out just the emblem, but y'all have continued to grow it and make it mean more as we have evolved as a district and as we as if we're getting better and you know more strategic and more complex in how we approach education I, I feel like the emblem is growing with us yeah so that's very good good thing to see great, great job Joanne thank you well, well the whole like team yeah. I'm just a messenger <laughs> and I missed it on Saturday <laughs> they got to do it on Saturday I wasn't oh, there no about that. Sunday, May the 6th, uh, HEB Excellence in Education Awards. Uh, this board is up for uh, Board of the Year. Uh, you're one of five. Uh, no one knows uh, who the victor will be. Of course, as you're already there because you're one of five. Uh, but I know you want to go for one, and so we'll, we'll be there and do that. We want the money. We so also we can do that <laughs> So we'll write to the bill. We also have two teachers uh, for the first time uh, who are uh, uh, for also educators of the year? Uh, and that's Miss Denise Hernandez and Miss Pachardo, and they will also be there at that event. 
Mark your calendars, Thursday, May the 10th. Uh, Mr. Jesse Garcia is going to lead us in the Yaha B Rally, our second annual <coughs> uh, anti-harassment, anti-bullying rally, where we invite some folks. Uh, we're going to run this year a secondary art show uh, simultaneously with it. And uh, it's going to be a really uh, great event. And last year proved to be a really great start. And we'll have some speakers and uh, provide some testimonial and keep, keep our uh, information about uh, harassment and bullying that our students have to, and adults have to contend with and how we keep uh, <coughs> to do a better job with that. The District Chess Club, Southwest High School, all day, all day with it. Saturday as well. Uh, there will be awards at 3 p.m. on that day. Uh, you know how good we are in chess. You heard that last time. Mm -hmm. One more thing, sir. I said, all right, uh, board members, we're going to read the numbers in a minute. We're going to have an executive session right across the way here. Where are we going? We are going to walk across this little parking lot uh, into the technology meeting. Around here, Texas government code 551.001-551.1. session is 152, and I know you have at least a half a dozen things to say. <laughs> we have a superintendent's recommendation on personnel. I, I have a superintendent's recommendation on personnel. Sure. I have a second? Second. The motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion's carried. Now your six things, sir. Well, I can do some introductions uh, of, of folks that you know that uh, are a few faces and new places. Uh, Dr. Sarah McAndrew is going to lead us in a program called Talent Management that uh, is a lot of our old work work, but uh, we haven't done, per se, with our feet on the street. We're really excited about what that can be done and uh, our district to learn from. Uh, to her left is Dr. Joanne Fay. Uh, she is going to become uh, the assistant superintendent, it's, it's kind of a new thing for her, of uh, <laughs> administration, human resource, and innovative program. And uh, Brandon Chris, we're going to say Brandon Chris. <laughs> uh, Sorry. This is Galila Garcia, is she here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Galila Garcia is going to elevate into the position of assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction. And we'll look for really great things from her. Joseph Guidry is going to become the principal of Southwest Legacy High School. He left right. yeah, he's, he's already over there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's all the announcements that I have at this point. I think it was about six. Do we have anything else? Oh, just sorry, but we took so long, guys. Appreciate your time and your patience. All right, we're adjourned at 154. Thank you.